everyone. I know we have everyone joining right now. Um, we're going to get started in just a moment. Just want to remind everybody to please mute your mic. Um, we'll have remarks by our um, distinguished members first, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. Please use the raise your hand feature um, and then direct your question to whoever you would like to answer it, um, or you could direct it to the entire group if, if that works for you as well. Um, and if we have everybody, it looks like we're ready. Uh, Mr. President. All right, thank you, David. Uh, hello and welcome everyone right. to our uh, first Senate and House Joint Press Conference of the Year on an incredibly important issue, and that is childcare here in the state of Maryland. Um, I do wanna thank Speaker Jones, um, who has with her delegates Queen, Ebersole, Solomon, and Solomon uh, for being here today. Um, I'd also like to deeply thank our Senate Majority Leader, Nancy King, as well as Senators Mary Washington and Katie Fry Hester for joining us. Um, these are some of the, the best leaders we have in the General Assembly uh, when it comes to the issue of young people and enhancing child care in the state of Maryland. Um, we all know the impacts of COVID, um, but what we also know is that those who have borne the greatest uh, challenge throughout the COVID crisis have, has been our young people. And that is most acutely felt in the child care system. Uh, over the last two years, over 750 Maryland child care providers have been forced to close. Uh, this doesn't hurt just the individual providers, uh, but it hurts the young people who are using those great facilities, as well as their parents and guardians uh, who have had to deal with an unreliable, uncertain future without high quality care for their young people. Um, what we also know is that while the K-12 system has certainly, uh, young people in the K-12 system have, have had real challenges, those youngest amongst us who are between the ages of zero and five, it is the most important time of their lives. Their outcomes that happen in that zero to five range matter more for their long-term life outcomes than any other period in their life. And that's why we're here today. We have got to make sure that Maryland's great child care system is as uh, effective and flourishing as it was prior to the pandemic with additional uh, opportunities to invest. So the bills we have are gonna focus on access, childcare access and scholarships. We wanna expand and stabilize grant programs for our childcare providers. Uh, we wanna fund childcare providers bonuses so that we have the best and the brightest who are working with our youngest Marylanders. Uh, and we wanna enhance our therapeutic childcare programs. So thank you all for being here. With that, I'd like to introduce and hand it over to uh, House Speaker Jones. Madam Speaker, to you. Thank you. Uh, one of the single most important issues we're facing as a state and a country is the worker shortage. We simply need to get more people back to work. Having strong, reliable childcare is a critical piece in addressing the workforce shortage. But our childcare providers are facing a crisis. Because of financial hardship and under enrollment, we lost nearly 800 licensed child care facilities during the height of the pandemic. Severely limited child care options are keeping more workers, particularly women, at home and out of the workforce. We're taking strong action to support Maryland's child care providers because the strength of our economy and Maryland families depends on it. This package of bills takes the necessary steps to increase our child care capacity across the state. It stabilizes our workforce and keeps our economy going strong. I want to thank Delegate Solomon, Queen, and Ebersol, and our partners in the Senate for working together to take meaningful action to address these critical issues. And with that, I'll turn it over now to Delegate Solomon for a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and thank you, President Ferguson, for for your leadership. Um, for the record, uh, my name is Delegate Jared Solomon, and I have the pleasure of representing Montgomery County in the House of Delegates. Um, it's been uh, a great opportunity to work on these package of bills with, uh, with so many of my esteemed colleagues here today. Um, and it's really about making sure that families have what they need for high quality care, and that uh, children and the child care providers have what they need to stay open, expand, and serve families. 
Um, I, I wanted to just particularly highlight Speaker Jones's leadership um, really on this issue long before she became speaker. Um, and it's because of her that we have, frankly, one of the best child care scholarship programs in the country. We were able to double the reimbursement rate that we provide uh, for child care providers and dramatically expand the income eligibility to allow thousands of Marylanders to be able to take advantage of the program. Um, but, but what we've seen over the last year is because of COVID, we've lost about 25% of the families who were enrolled in the scholarship program. And so we really uh, embarked on, on this piece of legislation in particular, HB 995, um, that focuses on the child care scholarship program, um, really to, to look at how we make it easier um, and simpler for families to enroll, how we expand um, access to the program, and how we make it um, easier and, and simpler for providers to be part of it. Um, and so, uh, you know, we do that by, by focusing on a couple of key areas. Uh, one is by creating a, a system of presumptive eligibility so that families can, on the first day they enter into a child care center, get the services they need to be able to get to work and, and get the high quality care for their kids. Uh, and we really look at uh, improving things on the back end for providers so that they're getting paid in a timely manner, that they're not wasting their time on paperwork and other administrative burdens that they're able to, to focus on care for children and, and serving families. Um, we know over the last few years, it's really never been more difficult, frankly, to be a parent. Um, and as the, the father of a 21 month old and uh, as a former teacher myself, it's never been more difficult being an educator. And so our role as policymakers is really to do everything we can to reduce barriers, reduce um, the hurdles in place so that our educators can focus on serving children and, uh, and families can get the support and the care that they need for, for their children. Um, so appreciate the opportunity to be here today and, and thank you again to our presiding officers for their leadership on this. Next up is Majority Leader King. Thank you, President Ferguson and Speaker Jones for inviting me to be a part of this conference today. And thank you to my Senate colleagues, Katie Fry Hester and Mary Washington for being here too. Um, our state has lost hundreds of childcare facilities during the pandemic, and we can't afford to lose more in the coming months. So I am also here to offer my full backing of our childcare programs by working to get them the support they desperately need. In Maryland, the average child care provider makes only about $36,000 a year in salary. So it is worth noting that our child care providers are among the lowest paid workers nationally. And even though they are critical to families with children who must leave home and work themselves. We're losing programs and staff at an alarming rate. And as our local economy begins to get back to pre-pandemic labor levels, the need for safe, quality child care is the utmost importance and our providers cannot be overlooked. As part of attracting and retaining more child care providers in Maryland, Senate Bill 806 provides $16 million in funding, which allows for $1,000 retention bonuses, as well as $1,000 new, hi new hire bonuses to providers. Again, we cannot fail to invest in our own child care providers is such a critical time. And in addition, we must ensure we include specialized child care needs in our comprehensive efforts to ensure all children have access to quality care. Senate Bill 506 provides for specialized child care and early childhood education by, by educators, early intervention providers, mental health providers, and health care providers to children under the age of six years who have de developmental delays, physical disabilities, delays in social, emotional, or behavioral functioning. These bills and the total efforts of the members here today will put us on better footing so that Maryland families can have certainty and providers can have predictability as we continue to grow our local economies and support all of our families and children. Thank you. I believe Delegate Queen is up next. That's correct, Mr. President. Uh, it's Delegate Queen, if, if ready. And if we um, unfortunately lost Delegate Queen, we can go to Senator Hester and come back. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Senator Katie Fry-Hester, pleased to represent District 9, Howard and Carroll Counties. 
Um, thank you, Mr. President, Speaker Jones, for inviting me to join you and to my colleagues for being here to support this incredibly important issue. I'm here today to show my personal support for our child care community and specifically to talk about Senate Bill 480. As the mom of two wonderful children, I know how much I have relied on child care centers so that I can focus on my work. Um, not anymore because they're a bit older, but when they were little, it was critical. However, over the past couple of years, the pandemic has upended many businesses, especially childcare providers. And the ramifications of the pandemic and the subsequent closure of daycares have created unpredictability for parents and led to exhausted families. With the pandemic, many childcare centers closed as parents worked remotely and with great difficulty, they also raised their young children. Single parents and essential workers who could not work from home felt the brunt of the childcare shortage more intensely and they were left with very few childcare options. It's vital for us at the state level to step up and provide the tools necessary to support this essential component of the economy, the community, and the childcare system. Senate Bill 480 is part of the solution. The Child Care Expansion and Child Care Stabilization Grant Program increases access and availability of licensed child care providers in the state by providing financial assistance to new or existing providers. These grants will provide financial support of up to $50,000 for centers in the state that are in danger of closing within the next 12 months due to financial hardship. This provides a stability for children and parents, the stability we have longed for since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have to acknowledge that a provider's salary, average salary is $36,000 annually. This is unacceptable and none of us can imagine living on that wage. We could lose a third of our childcare workforce in this pandemic if we, if we refuse to financially fund those who care for our children. This bill will help to increase livable wages, update educational supplies for children, and improve outdated facilities. If we truly believe that our children are the future, we also need to ensure livable wages for the providers who care for them. Childcare provides education, safety, comfort, and predictability when, when we are not available as parents. We need this predictability for ourselves and our children in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to thank you all for inviting me here again today and I can turn it back over to Delegate Queen or Delegate Ebersol. Delegate Queen. Thank you. I join Senate President Bill Ferguson, House Speaker Adrian Jones and my colleagues in the Maryland General Assembly to echo this important fact that the full economic recovery for our state cannot be achieved until the well-being of women is, is sustained and improved. Our state's child care providers, these small business owners, are essential to any economic recovery. I want to reiterate that the Maryland General Assembly has heard your voices. The lack of availability in child care is an issue that has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. During the pandemic, over half of the child care providers were in danger of closing, and we need to do more to help sustain this important industry. HB 1100, the Child Care Providers Employees Bonuses Bill, is intended to aid child care providers with attracting and maintaining employees with bonuses from MSD. As was mentioned with the Senate bill, we will provide $1,000 retention bonus for individuals with child care provider credentials, $500 new hire bonuses for individuals who stay um, in the job for six months or more, and additional bonuses for hiring assistance to providers that participate in the child care scholarship program. This is an, an important first step to attract and maintain quality employees to this vital profession. Thank you for the opportunity to talk today and we uh, welcome your support on this legislation. Delegate Ebersol. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, so people tell their, their personal stories about having children. I have grandchildren and actually uh, was charged during the pandemic with uh, watching them when their daycares closed. I thought about how fortunate my children were to have me available to be able to do that. And I worried a lot about other workers who were put in a difficult situation. The bill, Delegate Solomon, Delegate and Queen and I are working on HB 993 creates zero interest loans to help with capital expansions and acquisitions for childcare facilities. Our already existing difficulties with childcare capacity were exacerbated by the pandemic. 
and have highlighted that we cannot guarantee available childcare like we do with K-12. Childcare is mostly provided by LLCs and nonprofits, which can close when and if they need to. And as I stated at the beginning and as Speaker Jones highlighted, they have closed. This bill will help us maintain and increase childcare capacity across the state. By making money available to potential and existing LLCs and nonprofits that for expansion and establishment of facilities. The child care business is a business that is the foundation that supports other Maryland businesses by freeing up our workers to work there. They need the support and encouragement, and I am pleased to be part of the effort along with the Senate to offer it. Senator Washington. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senate President Ferguson and Speaker Jones for inviting us all here today as we talk about one of the most important issues facing our state and for this comprehensive package that's addressing access to equitable and sustainable child care services. As the Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Children, Youth and Families, I deeply appreciate the role that child care providers play in shaping Maryland's future. The children and families they serve are integral to our economic success at every stage of their lives and of the future of our state. We also know how critical the first years of an individual's life is to determining their ability to thrive in the future. That's why the legislature passed the blueprint for Maryland's future to drastically increase the publicly funded PK slots in every Maryland jurisdiction. For our state to reach its goals of lowering the immense financial cost to families related to childcare, we need to create thriving ecosystems of providers. That means taking a comprehensive approach that accounts for the gaps in the market, that facility funding can ensure that there are uh, requisite spaces that exist, and, and that skilled and caring workforce are very well supported. That's why this past of bills is being highlighted today, and it is so important. Maryland's families have faced immense disruption due to their daily lives over the last two years, and that is especially true for parents and caregivers. The Maryland General Assembly will be intensely focused on mitigating the burden that these parents and caregivers face, and grandparents, and, and which stand in the way of allowing our youngest and most vulnerable children thrive. The next 60 days will prove critical to our state's trajectory and our ability to uphold our promise to serve the whole child. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak today. I'd now like to turn uh, the mic back over to Senate President Ferguson to close us out. Thank you, Senator Washington. I believe we may jump into questions. Uh, is that right? That's correct. Yes, David, thank you'll you. be facilitating those. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, at this time, we'll uh, t start taking questions. If you can use the raise your hand feature in Zoom, we'll, we'll get a call on you. How do you do that? Uh, Mr. Welcome. Ford? Thank you very much. Uh, it may be directed more specifically to uh, Delegate Queen, but if anyone else would like to respond, that's fine. Just curious, how many employees, and, and well, I'll, I'll go back. In, I think it was last summer, there were a lot of child care providers during the public hearing with the Maryland Department of Education that, that were highlighting about one of the things they, they would like child care providers to have our bonuses. Do you know uh, how many employees would be affected with these uh, increase in bonuses? And also, is there... Any idea when a bill hearing would be scheduled? Uh, thank you. I don't know when the bill hearing will be scheduled yet, um, but the bonuses would probably impact uh, a, over over more than a quarter of our our, our um, child care providers, and so um, we have budgeted sixteen million dollars to go towards these bonuses, and so we expect that we would use. Um, you know, pretty much all of that to attract uh, new employees and to um, retain them. But we can get you the exact numbers. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Do we have anyone else? Looks like uh, David Collins has a question. Go ahead, David. David WBAL. 
Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for calling on me. I, I'm just curious about the fiscal note on all these bills. Where will all this money come from? The, the good news is we have a historic surplus in the state of Maryland. And while some of these are ongoing costs, a number of the investments being made today, it's almost it's close to $100 million that would be able to be invested into child care facilities. Uh, we have a $4.6 billion surplus. Uh, and so we are in a fortunate place to be able to invest resources in the things that matter the most. The infrastructure for child care uh, is one of those important sectors that we have to bolster for Maryland's economy to rebound. Thank you, David. Brian, go ahead. Uh, this question's for the uh, Speaker of the House. Madam Speaker, I was uh, interested in getting your reaction to the resolution filed this morning um, on impeachment articles against the governor and the process that this will take uh, working its way through the, uh, the, through the House. Okay. We had a uh, performer session this morning in which um, that resolution was forwarded to Rules Committee, which will have, will be dealing with that, right? It's gone on to rules. Thank you, Brian. Do we have anyone next? Uh, Brian from the AP, go ahead and ask a question. Uh, this is a question for either the Senate President or, or the Speaker or both. Um, the Governor today called on the uh, State Board of Education to uh, end its um, face covering policy in schools. Any any comment about that? Um, earlier this, Madam nice Speaker, you yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, I would say earlier this year, the the um, ALR committee, the overseas regulations, uh, took up this question um, from the regulations that were proposed by the school board. I believe in late December, and so. Uh, those regulations were approved. They had a requirement for masks, but provided exceptions with, based on the public health data as to when juris individual jurisdictions uh, would have uh, the ability to use their discretion to not have a uh, mask in place. And so I think it was a thoughtful uh, series of regulations that were put forward and the General Assembly approved those regs. And I suspect they will remain in place until we see something else from the board. So individual jurisdictions can make decisions to, to stop requiring masks without the board? So long as the public health data that was indicated in the regulations, uh, are, are, those conditions are met, then boards have the discretion to uh, move forward or not. Madam Speaker. Yes. If, if you wanted to, if not, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have about oh. a minute left. Oh. But if you want, the floor is yours, Madam Speaker. No, I'm just going to say that um, we, we trust MSDE and the local school systems to make the right decisions based on um, public health data, was stated, and to make decisions that keep both students and staff safe. So, um, you know, we, we put that in their hand because every area is different. It's not one. Okay, we have uh, one minute left for any questions on the child care. Um, legislation from today. If not, I appreciate everybody joining us today. Thank you. There's not. Thank you all very much. Not. Be safe, Thank you. Thank you.